The next uh, <coughs> set of sections are going to be tests. These tests are going to tell us uh, whether a series converges or diverges. So the first test we're going to look at is called the integral test. And if I can make that legible, the integral test, all we're going to do is treat the sum as if it was an integral. So this, most of these tests are going to require non-negative terms. So a series of non-negative terms. So non-negative means a k is going to be uh, zero or more for all k. That's what non-negative means. Uh, converges if and only if. Uh, the partial sums are bounded from above. And this leads us to the integral test. So integral test, we're going to look at AK, K equals zero to infinity. By the way, are you recording? Yep, we're recording. Does that say um, sums are bounced from above that line? Bounded. That's a really bad D. Bounded from above. All right, integral test. So we're going to have a sum. I need to make sure the AKs are all non-negative. So it need to be zero or more. So if we have this sum that has non-negative terms and there exists a continuous function f of x that's also greater than or equal to zero for all x. And here I just need to make sure it's all positive x. And this is a very uh, Complicated hypothesis, we need a lot of things. And f of k equals a k for all k. And f of x is decreasing. Then, so that was all hypothesis right there. then both the summation of ak and the integral fx dx from zero to infinity behave the same. And when I say behave the same, that means they either both converge or they both diverge. So the reason this is useful, we just finished a section about improper integrals, how to integrate from a number to infinity. So that is how we're going to take care of these infinite integrals. So let's go ahead and apply the integral test. So first example, prove the sum of 1 over k diverges. I don't want to start at 0 because that would give me a undefined term. So we're just starting from 1 and going to infinity. So I want to prove this diverges. So of course you're going to use the integral test. The hypothesis looks pretty complicated. Are these terms going to ever be negative? Nope. What function will equal 1 over k for all k values? 1 over x. 1 over x. 
x. This is probably the easiest part of the problem is picking the function. You're just basically replacing x by k, or k by x. Here's our function. This is continuous as long as x is not 0. We're going to start x at 1, not starting at 0. Actually, I'm going to modify the integral test a little bit, and I'll modify it in purple. So we'll start uh, k. Instead of starting it at 0, let's start it at, what's a nice letter, b. So I'll use the letter b to start it at. And that means we're going to, instead of starting our integral at 0, we're going to start it at b. And then this is, you see, positive for all x greater than or equal to b. All right, so you don't have to start at 0. You don't have to start at 1. You just need to start at some integer value. All right, so it's pretty obvious f of k equals 1 over k equals a k. So the hypothesis is actually relatively easy to satisfy. The only thing that might, may not be satisfied sometimes is the non-negative part. You just want to make sure your terms are not negative. No. that Because uh, you need your terms to be non-negative, that's the non-negative part. B is the starting, uh, the, the like lowest index value or the starting value. All right, so I think we satisfied everything. Uh, is our function decreasing? Is this f of x decreasing? Yes. Yep, so we got a decreasing function as well. All right, all we have to do is decide, is the integral convergent or divergent? So we're doing the integral test now. We're going from 1 to infinity. fx dx. All right, I'll give you one minute to integrate this. Antiderivative should be very easy, and then you just have to figure out how does that limit work. So first thing, lim, we'll go with uh, c approaches infinity, integral 1 to c. So antiderivative is easy, and then just be a little careful with your limit at the end. So if you graph the natural log function, it has a graph like this. There is no horizontal asymptote. There's no biggest y value on this graph. So it goes up to the right forever. Eventually it goes, goes very slowly up to the right, but there's no highest y value. It keeps going up higher and higher. So that's why when x approaches in infinity, when x goes to the right, your function goes uh, up to infinity. All right. Does that infinity mean convergent or divergent? Divergent. divergent. So convergent if you get a number, divergent if you don't get a number. Usually you're going to see infinity or negative infinity. Occasionally you might see if it keeps going up and down, uh, that would all be a does not exist, also divergent. But this one is divergent. So by the integral test, Our original sum, 1 over k, k equals 1 to infinity, also diverges. So we took a question about a sum, turned it into a question about integration, and then answered it. Because we've done integration for a, quite a long time.
So the next one's gonna be almost exactly the same. The only difference is I'm going to put a k squared in the denominator instead of a regular k. Pretty much your steps are identical. Obviously your antiderivative is not gonna be natural log. So your antiderivative is gonna be completely different, but you're still applying the integral test. So we got positive. This is never gonna be negative. So go ahead and write down your function it will be one over x squared. It's uh, decreasing, never negative. So you can apply the integral test now. So go one to infinity. And one over x squared is just x to the negative two. It's probably easier way to set it up for calculus. Remember it's improper integral, so you need a limit. So make sure you put your limit in before you take your antiderivative. So you should get your integral is one. So integral converges. If I got one or 100, it wouldn't matter as long as it converges to a number. Then I can say uh, by the integral test, our original series, summation one over k squared converges. Uh, I need to know what test you're using. Okay. So the only test you really know about, well, you have a divergence test, but n n neither of these would uh, automatically diverge by the divergence test, because both of these terms, even the one that actually diverged, if you look, those terms get very small. So the end term test doesn't, 
doesn't help us on series that, con that may converge. It only helps us if it's obviously not getting small. Uh, so the only real test you know is the integral test for now. So we're going to look. Today, when we learned um, that if the limit of the summation equals zero, we would then use one of these tests to find out exactly if it converges. Yeah, so the nth term test only detects if the terms, basically it says if the terms don't get small, don't tend towards zero, then the series cannot converge. Okay. So it tells you some conditions where the series would definitely not converge for. So it was like a test like it might converge, and then this test like tells you if it definitely does. Am, am I understanding it right? Or? The divergence test could has, has a condition that it gives you divergence if that condition is satisfied. So if your terms don't get small, there's no way it converges. But for terms that do get small, the divergence test doesn't help you. I see. Okay. So we're looking at examples that the terms get small. Almost every ex problem I'm going to give you, probably 95% of the problems I give you, the terms are going to get small. The only question is, are they getting small enough? Gotcha. And we just looked this second example, they got small enough. The first example, they didn't get small enough. They added up to infinity. So both cases, the terms are getting small. They just weren't getting small fast enough in the first example. That makes sense. And the divergence test would, wouldn't tell you anything about either of these two because the terms are getting small. Thank you. It's kind of like saying um, you're not going to be able to drive to California if, you start, if you're only going to drive north. But if you don't drive north, can I say you're definitely going to get to California? I don't know. Maybe you're just going to drive east. Like, so I can only say like what automatically would make it fail. Gotcha. All right, we're going to look at the P series now. This is a very important series. It should definitely appear on your uh, cheat sheet. So the P series is summation 1 over k to the P power. So I want to know what values of p will this converge for, and what values of p will it diverge for. The last two examples were both p series. So we just saw the p equals 1 series. And that diverged. And when p is 2, that series converged. P can be any number from negative infinity to positive infinity. So I want to know for the other numbers what's happening. So we're going to apply a integral test here. So what is our function? F of x equals what? 1 over x to the p? Yep, 1 over x to the p. If you're using more than two brain cells, you're thinking too hard. Your function should be very, very obvious. You're basically replacing k by x. Or maybe sometimes you might see an n in there instead of k. So you're picking your function should be the easiest part of the problem. All right, integral test. Now we're going to integrate. This is not going to be as long as x is greater than or equal to 1. This will never be negative. So we satisfy the integral test requirements. 1 over x to the p, I'm going to write as x to the negative p. So, so we're starting our k at 1. So we're going to start our x at 1. Does that make sense? If I brought that back to 0, I'd have problems. My first term would be undefined. So that wouldn't make sense to write that series down. So, so that's why we'll start at 1. And that, starting at 1, makes our x start at 1. So we got limit c approaches infinity. Integral 1 to c. What is the antiderivative x to the negative p? Negative x to the negative p plus 1. So it'll be x to the negative p plus 1. What is my denominator? Oh, or negative p. Negative p plus 1. What p-value will this not be true for? It should be really obvious. Negative 1. Negative 1. No. Positive 1. Positive 1. 
So this is true when P is not one. Good news is we already took care of P equals one. We already know it diverges. So I don't need to do that a second time. So we're gonna assume P is not one. This is gonna look very different if P is greater than one versus if P is less than one. So there's two cases. Our first case, we'll go P less than one. Let's take care of the uh, small and negative P values. All right, if P is less than one, I'm going to solve for negative P plus one. So I will just subtract P to the other side. So zero less than one minus P, which is the same as negative P plus one. So if P is less than one, that means negative P plus one is positive. So let's go through with this limit here. So we have c to the negative p plus one over one minus p minus, uh-oh, I lost my other endpoint. We're going from one to c, one to c minus one over one minus p. All right, what is the limit of this numerator? c is getting bigger and bigger and the power is positive. So our base is getting bigger and bigger and the power is positive. So what's infinity to a positive power? It is infinity. Even if the power was um, a very small number, so we know the power is greater than zero, even if the power was like one one millionth, one one millionth root of infinity is still infinity. As long as you have a positive power, you're still going to get infinity out of this. Yeah, it would be it would be one over infinity, which would be zero. Which would be zero. So that's what we're about to do next. So for right now, our power is positive, so we got infinity to a positive power. So it's going to be infinity minus who cares whatever that number is doesn't matter. It's going to be infinity. The point is p is not changing. P is fixed, so we're not taking a limit when p is changing around. Only uh only that C is changing. So this is divergent. All right, so when P is less than one, we have divergent. Now we're gonna do the second case. P is greater than one, and I'm going to again solve for uh, minus P plus one. So subtract P to the other side. And we see that minus P plus one is now negative. So we're gonna redo our limit. Everything's gonna work out pretty much the same. So I'm just gonna skip a step. So we have to decide what happens to the infinity to the negative p plus one power. The only thing that really matters is that negative p plus one is now less than zero. So it's basically a reciprocal. So it's gonna act like one over infinity or zero. So it's gonna be zero minus one over one minus p. So we get a number, so this is convergent. So when p is greater than one, we get a 
convergent series. So any questions on those two cases? Yeah, we're going to write a summary at the top where I'll, uh, there's another case, P equals 1, and I'm going to group that. P equals 1 is going to get grouped in with the divergent because we proved that P is 1 diverges. All right, so we're going to run back to the P series. We're going to get more specific about when it converges and diverges. So let's write convergent first. Converges when P is bigger than 1, diverges when P is not greater than 1, meaning P is less than or equal to 1. So there's our P series right there. This is a very, very useful series. Where are they equal to 1? Less than or equal to Yeah, it's. Yeah, we just we just threw it in there. All right, that's pretty much all there is to this section. The integral test, you just write integral, integrate the integral, convergent, divergent, then your series does the same thing. There's not much more going on. The only tricky part is, can you integrate or can you not integrate? And then can you take a limit or can you not take a limit? Neither of which are skills we learned right now. So those are skills from previous chapters. Occasionally, there may be a L'Hopital's rule at the end you have to use. Maybe your limit, you know, you're going to infinity, so pretty uh, common thing to see infinity over infinity. Or the worst case scenario, zero to the zero, so one of those crazy forms you got to rewrite and all that stuff. All right, so I want to talk about one thing before we move on. We just saw that 1 over k equals infinity. So let's not go to infinity. Let's just go to m. So if it goes up to infinity, of course, there will be some value. If I add up the terms of some large m value, that will eventually hit 20. 20 is not a huge number. How many terms do you think you have to add up before you break 20? A lot. A lot. Specifically, m needs to be greater than or equal to 178 million. That's how many numbers you have to add together to break 20. So to break 40 would be a significantly larger amount of terms. So even though it does go to infinity, you have to spend a very long time adding up terms to even 178 million times. Yeah. Now, what if, what if I put like 2 million here, then I'd have to count up quite a few more terms. So just to hit 20 it takes 178 million terms added together. No big deal. Knock it out in the afternoon. Uh, so another issue you run into if you try to uh, use a computer uh, to calculate this 178 million terms, if you use decimals or floats, you would eventually run out of precision. They would just tell you all the numbers are zero after a while. So there are some limitations using estimations uh, when things get very, very small or very, very big. But right now we're looking at things that are tiny. So, for example, what's the last term in this series that I had together? The last term would be that number right there quite a small number. That would be the last term that I add together. So that's a really small number. All right, that's the end of integral test. So we're going to jump into comparison tests now. So there's going to be two comparison tests. The first one is less useful, and the second one is very useful. So the original, the comparison test, these are going to use some inequalities. So 
So when I write down all k, I don't mean every single real number k. I mean uh, all the k values that are in your summation. So it usually means from integers from 0 to infinity, or from 1 to infinity, or wherever our k's are going to come from. So generally, when I just say all k, I mean whatever your summation is written as. Uh, so this usually going to be 1 to infinity or 0 to infinity. So I like to think of this as the Goldilocks theorem. We're going to uh, see what happens if the outside series converges or diverges. So if we have this, uh, these terms lined up like this, and summation CK, and I'm not going to write the initial K value, it's usually 0 or 1. So if you know that CK converges, what could I say about the BK series? So CK, each CK is bigger than or equal to each BK. And the other important thing you have to know is they're all not negative. So they can't go less than zero. So if the bigger series converges, what would have to happen to the smaller series? It has to converge also. And it, specifically, we can even say it converges to a number equal to or less than the sum of the CKs. So if the big one converges, then the middle one, BK, converges. I'm going to put the word if and if. So we're going to look at the small series right now, AK. So let's say the small series diverges. What does it mean to diverge? No finite number. So it either adds up to infinity. It can't be negative infinity because we assume these terms are positive. So it could either be infinity or does not exist, meaning it keeps jumping around. So if the small one diverges, then the middle one, BK, diverges. So look at our first example. So we're comparing in the, you're talking about like the second one down here? Yeah. So, oh, it is small. so we're looking, what happens if the smaller one adds up to infinity, then the bigger one has to add up to something equal to or bigger, gotcha. meaning infinity. Whereas the first comparison is comparing CKs to the BK. So if the bigger ones, if I add up all the bigger terms and let's say I get seven or some number, then if I add up terms that are smaller, I'm going to have to get a number 7 or smaller. Right. So that's what's happening right here. <coughs> so do you remember the physicist method of figuring out convergence or divergence? When things go to infinity, you basically ignore inside here, what would I ignore? That minus 1 wouldn't matter anymore if k is really big. So we're going to do the same thing. What we need to do on comparison test is pick a series to compare to. And it's a lot uh, less easy, a lot more difficult than picking a function that behaves just like this. Here would be a really bad one to compare to. I'll write it in red. You probably could go integral test on this too, yeah. I don't think it would be hard to integrate this function. It'd be a u sub and you'd be done. 
So another thing that uh, is important to realize is there's usually more than one test that'll work. So I'm going to show you lots of tests. There's not one correct test. There's usually more than one test that works on a, a particular series. So I'm going to give you, I don't know, five tests or so, and you can use whichever one you think works better or that you can find faster or however you want to do it. But you don't need to use a specific test. You just have to use one of the tests correctly. All right, why would it be useless to compare this series to itself? So it's going to be equal. Yeah, basically the exact same problem written a second time. So you don't want to compare it to itself. However, there is a good one to compare it to. That minus one doesn't really change much. So I'm going to compare it to five over five K. Forget the minus one. And reduce that down, that's 1 over k. So pi over 5k is 1 over k. And what do we know about the sum of 1 over k? It diverges. Why does it diverge? What kind of series is it? It's a p series. It's a p series. And specifically, it's a p equals 1 series. So there's an invisible one that we don't normally write. This is a p equals one series right here. Which means it's divergent. And I'm just getting this divergence right back from what we wrote down about the p series somewhere right here. This is what I'm using. This diverges right here. So maybe I'll put a second box around it so you don't forget it. So this really needs to go on your cheat sheet with the name P-series so I know what you're talking about. All right, now we have to do our inequality. So we have a series we wrote down that's supposed to be divergent. Why is this inequality true? The number of the denominator is smaller, making the total bigger. So on the right side, we have a slightly smaller denominator, meaning a bigger fraction. All right, so our original series is slightly bigger than this P series and we know the P series diverges so our original series has to diverge as well. And it diverges by the comparison test. So the next example we're going to do is probably one of the most tricky ones to set up. Very easy to write down, not easy to set up. So we're going to do the sum of k factorial. And we can start it at 0 or 1, doesn't really matter. So let's write out the terms here. So 1 over 0 factorial is 1 over 1, plus 1 over 1, plus 1 over 2. I'm going to write this 1 over 2 times 1, plus 1 over 3 times 2 times 1, plus 1 over... 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. I'm going to write a generic term out here. It's 
So I just wrote the nth term right there. It's 1 over 1 times 2 times 3, et cetera, et cetera, times n. When in doubt, it's a reasonable thing to do to just write out the terms. If you're not sure what to do, no matter what, you can always at least write terms out. So the reason that I say this one is difficult, I'm about to make an estimation. So let's look at the nth term right here. How many numbers that are two or larger are we multiplying together? Way more than two. How many n? What's our n value? N. Yeah. So how many less than n are we multiplying together? N minus two or n plus two. So there's basically one is left out. So there's n minus one numbers we're going to multiply here. So I'm going to compare it to 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. So I'm going to replace the denominator products by numbers that are 2 and bigger by just 2 repeated n times. Maybe it's better if I write it 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. n minus 1 time, uh, numbers. Which fraction is bigger? The one on the... Why is the one on the right bigger? Because the denominator isn't increasing in size. So the denominator is smaller. I don't know how to describe that. So the denominator is smaller on the right, making the fraction bigger on the right. Does that make sense? And of course, this is 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. All right, looking at this inequality, and on the left we have an. Looking at this inequality, if this series converges, then the an series converges. So if this bigger one converges, then an has to converge. I better switch back to K. So not only do I know this converges, I actually can figure out what it converges to. What type of series is this? It's not a p-series. It's geometric. So it's almost set up in perfect geometric form. The only problem is we got a k minus 1 right there. So we're going to break out one of the 2s. So there's a uh -oh. Maybe a minus 1. Is that right? That looks good. We got a minus 1, so we add those two powers together, we get k minus 1. So this is 2 times the sum 1 over 2 to the k. And it's super easy to write down. 1 over 1 minus r, which is 1 half. I can even, you don't need to go this far. So we get 4. So that adds up to 4. All right, that means on the right side, we have a convergent series. So our series we just created converges by the comparison test. Our original summation also converges. So again, to review, we created a bigger series and saw that that slightly bigger series converged. So our series was smaller. And I can tell you it adds up to something that's 4 or less. It can't be bigger than 4 because every term is smaller than the terms in this geometric series. 
So we just got the 1 over factorial converges. Yes, boss. So the next problem we're going to look at All right, this is very similar to the first problem, except I add a one to the denominator, which makes this one a little smaller. So we'll try to apply the, convergent, uh, the comparison test and then fail, and then we'll break out the limit comparison test, which is a little bit more useful.